Okay, that's it. So yeah, mm, we can define values in variables and values are encouraged by Scala, uh, uh, by Scala actually, and you can do this uh, that way the compiler will encourage you to do this uh, every time. Uh, you can you can have different types of literals, primitives, for long and doubles and quotes. Uh, there is something called inference when the compiler uh, writes types for you, basically infers it. Uh, it works in most cases. Uh, it will not work uh, for recursive functions. Uh, yeah, you can cast and to transform from string to integer, you just need to call explicit method to int. Uh, and there is uh, the same method to string on, on all of the objects, basically, we, uh, that came from Java. Yeah, you can do if else, and if else it's an expression which returns result. Um, yes, this is how you can define a list, and this is uh, the common way, and this is uh, uh, kind of a builder, double column, which is, uh, we will see what it is later, but this is kind of a builder of the list. Uh, or you, can, you can prepend element to the head of the list. And list is basically a link at least data structure. Uh, we'll go through that later. Yes, you can, the same way you can add um, to the tail of the list. Um, there is uh, something called for loop uh, and for yield loop in Scala. Um, and you can build ranges like that. Yeah, so uh, the thing to remember here is that in four, in a body of the four loop, uh, every line is kind of statement. This is, in this case, it's not, it's not uh, an expression. Every line is kind of statement. You can think of that in an imperative way. So you are assigning something, uh, a latent expression on the right and assigning it to the uh, left side. And this operator is kind of, uh, the, the left arrow is kind of extracting value from the uh, traversable, from the sequence of uh, function. And you can, you can do if, uh, you can put if condition here, but it, it has a little bit different syntax, uh, the parentheses are omitted. So you can filter uh, your looping that way. And you can yield values uh, in the result. There is a while construction, which is pretty much regular. Uh, yeah, there are different kinds of functions, uh, function syntax for anonymous functions. There is a special symbol uh, underscore, uh, which is used in multiple ways. And you can do uh, wherever you like with a list with a uh, common, common uh, functions, which I think nowadays exist in most languages as well. Um, yes, so there can be nested functions and yes, pattern matching. That's something that we uh, did not cover uh, yesterday, did not fully cover yesterday. So pattern matching is kind of switch case in Java, but uh, you can do much more with that. So pattern itself, it can be either a value or this can be a variable. I'll show you this one, yes. So this can be a value, like you can match on strings. And underscore, this is like a default case. Uh, you can as well match uh, a list or anything else as well. So in the case of list, you can use this double colon to extract uh, the structure of the list, the head and the tail. And tail is everything except the head element. And you can do um, you can do more things with pattern matching tools later. Yes, and this works pretty much the same with uh, with assignment. In some cases, you can do uh, the same thing just with uh, assignment. Yes. So um, and just to just to show you uh, maybe. Visually, 
to refresh memory. You can basically uh, repool the, uh, the repository again. There is something new there. Uh, so for instance, to use for comprehension, you can do, uh, in this case, this is, we are writing a function to filter the list with the given function. So we are iterating over a list, and then we can use if expression here to filter uh, like that. Yes, and we are yielding these elements. Oh. So we'll yield only if it's taken in this case. Sorry? We will yield yes. only yes. if Yes, so this, if this, this is expression based. What I selected here, this is expression. And expression can be anything and the function call as well. So this evaluates to the value, to the balloon value, and we use it to filter our, uh, our iteration. There can be multiple uh, iterations as well. You can do something like one, two, ten. So under the hood, this four yield loop works much more complex than you may expect, but we will cover this in the in two weeks. Uh, well, on function programming classes. So uh, yeah, so this is what you can do here. And what I wanted to do also to go through the uh, something that we posted here yesterday because uh, I noticed some of the some of the things that uh, for instance syntactic uh, things that can be changed for instance return keyword uh, this is usually this is discouraged in Scala so you should not use it you can but uh, if you do for instance here the IDE will show you the hint, and to use that hint, you can use the uh, cave Indian. I, I posted the cheat sheet today. Um, so this is out, enter, and yeah. So th there are a lot of suggestions in idea to do or work with code. Yeah, so uh, yes, and when you do branches, uh, when you do branches in a functional programming way, it is encouraged to do both trees of uh, conditional expressions. This is, um, if you omit return uh, keywords, then you are forced to do so. And this is the functional, the declarative way of doing things. If you have any, any conditional, you should write explicitly two uh, trees. And that's the reason why return keyword is discovered, because you can put it somewhere and you just uh, read in the function, you, can, you, you don't see where it is and where the exit of the function happens. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So that's something I wanted to mention here. Um, okay. Yeah, and for instance, how you can do pattern matching on list just to refresh what we just saw on the slide. So this is would be least match case, age, and tail, which is like head. And this is double colon operator, which is structor kind of. So this is how we can return head of the list. And in case if it's a new list, actually we, could, we should write an error or something because this is empty list here. Yeah? So Something like that. So, and now, um, <coughs> what I wanted to do to proceed with this pattern matching practice, uh, let's proceed to this X seven nine, and there is a simple task to define the last element of the list. Uh, we can do it pretty much the same way that I did with head, but probably here the recursion should be used. So, uh, whenever somebody finishes with this, uh, we can practice one, one thing. You can, if somebody finishes this assignment, you can go here and write it on my laptop and explain like, what you are writing, if you would like. Let's try this. Mm 
this open the code where is the previous one? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Is everybody can see this in the last rows? Because for me, it's like my eyes are not so good. So. It's possible to open the zone translation. I mean, yeah? Ah, so you're looking to interest I'm not because I'm ah, okay. really close, but okay. nice. solution to this problem. Cool. Remember, you can do some anything with this double problem. Okay. First, second. We can do something like that as well. And should we use uh, braces? No. Which braces? Uh, arrow. Arrow, arrow? Through, yeah. Through you or? Well, uh, if there is some edge case, for instance, if it's M2, if there is no last element, what should you do? There, there will be a dedicated section in today's lecture on error handling. Uh, brackets. Ah, brackets? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for error? Yeah. Uh, I think so. No, you can omit it because yeah, in this case you can omit it. Can I use like uh, this double? Double column. Yeah, double column and this is a new Yes, you can, you can. But if you do, for instance, in this case, comes like that, yes? And you will try to compile it, yeah. the compiler will tell you that uh, this much will, uh, it actually, yeah, it's actually in which will code, but if I change this vice versa like this and try to compile again, uh, it says to me, match may not be exhaustive. It would fail on the following input nil. So, okay. the compiler is too smart. <laughs> I mean, have just one element of this. Uh, the tail would be empty. Yes, the tail would be nil. But you can match this in this second case in, in, in my school. Can you reverse this and Well, you yeah, you can. Actually, in Scala, there are like dozens ways to do something. And we are just practicing pattern matching here, but you can. Uh, do this in with the existing functions which are already in the standard library. So. Why do we use the uh, word tail here? Because we can uh, do anything here. That's the reason. That's something like um, implicitly compiler will define the value and will assign define the value with that name and assign uh, expression. Is there Analog of the shortened version of if then else, like this question mark and double. No, it's just if else. You can use it uh, the same way. There is no 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 such syntax in Scala. Try. Yes, you can. Okay, so I'm switching. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
this L then much? Yes. yes. Then, uh, you should open a uh, square um, curly, curly braces. Curly braces? Curly braces are curly bracket. Yeah, yeah, arrow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, what if I supply the needle here? Yeah, I just need a ah, okay. check, but I just submit it. Well, it will not work if I supply new. Okay. And actually, compiler will tell you that. Um, okay. You can check lengths of the input. Sorry? I'm sorry. It's possible to add a check in for lengths of this input. If it's more than. Yeah, you can. You can do that. Okay. okay. Uh, error. You can uh, throw exception as well. Error is just something from new. Because error, it's a throw new. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is the one of the way uh, you could do this. Okay. This is the uh, the the solution of Yarama is more or less more than I expected. But uh, how is your name? Dima. Yes. So Dima solution uh, works as well. And the thing is that you could even do this like that if tail equals new, because you can uh, have if expression in the uh, match case syntax as well. And then the second case, you can uh, wait, case add tail. This can be done that way as well. Sounds like that, yes. Oh, well, let's, let's just. Yeah. Is this for select for what for a least precise one? Because H will be. Oh, sorry. This let's just test. Zero is. Let's just test. I'm not sure actually if it uh, works. Yeah. Right so. Um, yeah. Okay. So this one works. Yeah, and if it's new, and there should be yes, yeah, there, there. Okay, so this this works. This works. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what else? Mm. Yeah. Do you see the exact results true or false of your assumption? Uh, how what? How do you see result on this assert? How I miss it? Okay, I'm just uh, assert. It's a function which takes the boolean value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, you, how you see that it's true or false? I'm just comparing to three because I'm supplying the least. I'm supplying okay. a list which. Uh, yeah, I understand logic, and if it falls, it will. Uh, okay, let's let's do this this way. Assertion error. Oh, yeah. yeah. So this is like uh, this throws an exception basically, which is called assertion error. Uh, okay, we will. Finish. Yeah. Uh, let's go further. Let's go further and. I'll switch to the displays. I'm doing uh, it a little bit quicker today than yesterday. So there were tuples, as you might remember. Okay, is 
uh, is everybody okay with uh, with uh, this last function? Is everybody understands everything? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for nil? Yeah. Well, nil is an empty list. Nil, uh, yeah, okay, I understand your question. So, um, there are different kinds of kind of null values. And uh, for instance, uh, which language do you program in? Python, Java? Okay, in Java there is a null. This is not the same thing. Nil, it's an, uh, it's a, uh, you can, I can write here like list with empty parentheses and it's, it will be the same. So that's, that's it. And there are other kinds of null, kind of null values in Scala we will see later. So, so sorry? Uh, if tail, yeah, if tail and replace the rearrange last two. Well, we can just omit this one, yes. In this case, because I already had it here, this check. Okay, this is going to be the um, the most concise. Uh, oh, sorry, there should be a regression here. Yeah. We are not inter interested in head, so we can put this underscore. Underscore can be used uh, wherever we, are, we don't care about the name. For instance, in an anonymous function uh, syntax, if you are not interested in argument, maybe we can use underscore. Sorry? Uh, uh, sorry, I messed it a little bit. Yeah, so there was a. Uh, yes, okay. Because I just transformed it from what was previously written. Yeah, so this is this is going to return head. Yeah, like that. Sorry about that. Yeah, let's just test it and confirm that it works. Yeah. So we're basically messing around with the syntax here just to learn different kinds of things because when you will uh, read the, the code of actual libraries uh, that we will use during next classes, you will need to know the syntax to understand what's going on. Okay, can we go further? I think yes. Uh, yeah, so that was something. Okay, tuples, which are containers, as you might remember. So whenever you have a need to uh, treat a group of different values at the one value, you just put parentheses around it, and this is a tuple. And tuple has uh, the, the type, because everything has a type in Scala, and tuple has a type, a composite type of these values. In this case, it's in string double, so um, this is the type of the value t. And you can retrieve the, um, the values, like uh, the common syntax. Uh, and there can be value, uh, tuples up to 22 fields in Scala. This is a limitation, 22. You can remember that uh, because this limitation mm, makes sense in some other places else. Okay, so um, we, we already used recursion a little bit. And what I wanted to show you mm, is something called tail recursion in Scala. And what we need to understand is that uh, there is no, in a pure functional world, there is no uh, such thing like a loop, like a uh, while loop or something like iteration uh, like that, because this is imperative construction. And in functional world, uh, 
the way to iterate under something and, and the sequence of values is recursion. But um, let's, uh, I will go to the desk and I'm prepared today I brought the, uh, the whiteboard marker. Then we can I promote think. with the memory then if we make everything through the Yeah, that, that's something uh, which can be a problem. And better understand what happens when the function is called. There is something called st uh, frame stack, a stack of frames. Uh, stack of frames, when the function call is happening, everything, uh, every, every, um, every stage of this call uh, is stored in memory. So this is kind of really a set of values. Uh, and on each row, the, the state of the, of the function is written like local uh, variables, arguments, the state of, the, of, of those arguments. And when uh, one more uh, function call is happening, I will uh, switch to the next slide because there is an example of this uh, recursion function. So this is a common implementation of a plural function. So when, when we proceed deeper in this recursion, one more uh, stack, uh, one more frame is added to this stack, uh, which is slightly done. Okay. Looks like this, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, so we are going deeper, deeper, but this is uh, uh, stored in memory. So memory has some limitation, yeah. And at some point, GBM just will throw error uh, out of memory error. In this case, if you supply a very value relatively big uh, to this function. And the solution of that. So this, this is one, uh, one of the cases. Uh, in the case of factorial, this implementation of factorial function will work uh, like that. And this is how it expands, as you might see. Uh, and there is another, uh, another uh, type of recursion implementation. Uh, this is a common uh, divisor, com um, great, common div uh, great common divisor function, which uh, find the greatest common divisor, yes? So, uh, for instance, for these two numbers, this is going to be seven. You understand what the, uh, the function does, yes? Yeah, so this is the way it ex as this function expands. And you can see the difference. So in case of factorial, uh, this was growing and growing and growing. And in this case, uh, the, uh, only this if expression changes, but the function call is every time in the end. So this is how this expression expands if we uh, rewrite it step by step. And the reason of that uh, is that in this uh, function implementation, recursion call, um, a recurs a recursive call happens as a last statement. But in the case of factorial, this is not the last statement. There is another function called here. So this is like a uh, nested, nested uh, uh, series of calls. This is why it expands that way. And people notice that and uh, find it out that this can be uh, in a functional pro programming languages. This can be uh, done in a, in a more in a better way, they found that this kind of, uh, this thing called tail recursion. So, uh, the greatest common divisor implementation can be annotated with such annotation, and then uh, compiler while compiling this program will transform this into the actual while loop kind of while loop. So there will be no uh, recursion, and the stack uh, frame uh, stack of frames will not uh, be used. That way, there will be just one frame and one basically function call. So this is something about tail recursion. It sounds like killer feature to be honest. I mean, it's very cool. Yeah, <laughs> so great. Well, this this was invented because uh, 
there is no other way to do iteration in the uh, in a pure functional languages. In Scala, you can write var variable, yeah, and just uh, do a mutation. But this is um, like a very functional way of doing iteration, and that's why we are doing this kind of recursion. Uh, this boring task with the recursion because that's the functional way of thinking. Uh, yeah. Is there any questions in the, at this point? Can we write the body all to this tailor? Yes, this is going to be a task to write a factor. But first of all, to make it a little bit easier, um, because probably this will not be that easy just to write a factorial function from scratch. Uh, you will spend a lot of time on that, so we will. Uh, I will. I'm switching to the. So, I'm switching to the IDE, and there is a x tan tail, and okay, that was a task to define a sum function yesterday in a recursive fashion. So. I will uh, copy it here just to show you, just to remember how it was defined. And the task is to fill the gaps in this next implementation to provide the tail recursive uh, sum. Because in this, uh, right now, it's not tail, it cannot be tail recursive because of this plus. And, and if I annotate it with tail rep, for instance, like that. By the way, I can use Alt Enter to import. Well, but it will not work because it's worksheet. Sorry. Uh, so I still have to write. Yeah. And it's it says to me recursive pole not in tail position. Too smart. Okay. Yep. Uh, you mean how it detects that there is tail recursion? Why it can why it can compile and detect tail recursion? Why 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 do we why we need to do this explicitly? Annotation, yes. Well uh you can you can submit the uh, change to the Scala compiler, and then you can do this on the side. It's strange because uh, compiler can detect that uh, this function is not there. Yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, not everything should happen implicitly. Some things should still happen explicitly. Something like Taylor rack annotation, which basically change the way the the function is, is executed. I think it makes sense to still having all these uh, uh, syntax features of Scala, it still makes sense to have something to be done explicitly. So I'm not particularly sure. We can, we can omit it. It could be done like that, but I, I have no idea why. I would say it's quite easy to detect the last well, in some, yeah, it's quite easy if you construct because compiler basically will construct the um, syntax tree uh, of the of the expression of your uh, program. So yeah, it will see. This is how it detects basically that there is no type of version. There's also uh, more precise version of Should 
consider these uh, functions which are very uh, complicated. Uh, writing uh, this function to general person functions is a complicated task. I had a person deal with this later. Yeah, yeah, go on. Not every function is a general person. Yes, this is the, the, the great uh, thing you brought, you brought up. Uh, what's your name? Yeah, so, uh, well, Dimmer is uh, completely right. So, not every, theoretically, not every function can be rewritten to the Taylor recursion. Um, and that's a fact. And that's, you're completely right. That's, a, that's, uh, that's why it is uh, required to state explicitly, because you have to, uh, to know what's happening, or you should you at least uh, need to know what recursion, how, how it is executed internally. So with this annotation, the, somebody else who will read your code will see this. Okay, this is the recursion. Yeah. We need to input two, two numbers and return sum of them. Uh, so sum of numbers between first and second. Uh, and I've applied a function to them. A function? Which function? Ah, <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So a function is not uh, really... I, I know how to solve this problem without the f function, if you need just a sum to numbers. Apply f to the number and that's it. Yes, you, yeah, you can. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, let's, let's just test what it does, to be sure. Yeah, this has to be 12. Okay, you can see it on the right side here. Yeah, so, um, yeah. I have a question about this kind of syntax function, definition function code, and we can have a function. You mean this one? Yeah. So, uh, this is one of the ways to define anonymous function in Scala. <laughs> and then another one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry? I was Googling it for a while. Yeah? <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, probably. Would you write uh, this function, add another function, like three functions? Uh, first uh, gets the function itself, then another gets another function, like the yeah, variation yeah. of that. You are completely, what's your name? Anton, uh, you are completely right. This is something like carrying, but to make function uh, explicitly carry it, you should uh, call the uh, carried 
method on the function itself. So this is something we uh, I was planning to cover in the next uh, session in two weeks um, uh, to dig deeper into the functions itself. Uh, but yes, this is at this point. Just remember that you can do this that way, or just to put parentheses anywhere you want. And yes, for for those who already know a little bit what is current, so this is a, a kind of current. We will not cover it right now because we have a lot of other things. Yeah. <coughs> okay. I ask one more question. Yes. We have got 12, but some of them, one plus four plus ten, two or nine. Okay. Yeah. Yes, it's six, not nine. nine. Yeah. Uh, well, mm. is there any other questions at this point? Okay. What's going on? Uh huh. Okay. Just stop working. Okay, I will try to substantiate this. Oh my God. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so that's, that was actually what we wanted to cover at the first section uh, of this uh, lectures on Scala. And there are some, some more things like this sign, as you may notice, uh, it's actually a method which returns, uh, which throws an exception. <laughs> so this is useful in case order for not implemented methods. And yes, uh, that, that's, I uh, forgot the name of that sign. So you usually omit it in Scala, but if you want to write uh, uh, multiple statements in one line, you should divide them by that. Uh, and you might, Probably wondering where uh, all the things come from. Like, uh, why do I need to import something explicitly, but I don't need to import, for, in uh, for instance, integer or list? And uh, there is a class in Scala standard library. I suggest you to, to uh, push the command plus O or control plus N on Linux and Windows machines and you should uh, have this dialog open. <coughs> Can you do that, yeah? Yeah, and you just search for pred-dev. So pred-dev is a, um, it's actually an object. Well, we will go through that in a, in a 10 minutes. Uh, but this is something which is imported, imported uh, implicitly. So every source file kind of have this import already implicitly. So there are a lot of different stuff we find here, standard stuff like stream, for instance, which came from Java Lang stream. And there are, uh, what else? This assert method, which we use, this uh, three question marks method, stuff like that. So this is not that big. And uh, just to, to keep that keep that in mind. If you are not sure about something, where it comes from and for why it works that way, you can uh, look into PredF and just uh, see what's happening. Yeah, that was something I wanted to mention. Let's switch to the to the second. Uh, 
I will turn it off and I'll open Okay, so um, the first part took a little bit more than I expected. The workshops are harder than I thought. Uh, so this is the second part in which we will concentrate a little bit more on the kind of environment in which uh, the whole thing is happening, uh, how the compilation is going on, how the, uh, uh, how the G a little bit of GBM basics, how the program is executed itself, the, the structure of project, how the build is happening, then we will go through, quickly go through the object-oriented programming installer, um, go through the look at the type system hierarchy is the top and the bottom of the type system in Scala. Uh, we will go through the common data structures and where they are in, the, in this hierarchy of collection types and look at some of the patterns of error handling, some of the approaches that we can use in Scala. So first of all, oh, what happened to the, to the phone? Okay. Mm. First of all, this finally hello world example in Cali. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to do, I want to, uh, I want to, uh, export slides so you can look at them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It will take thirty seconds. Again. And the way I will do it, I will share from Drive, because if I will make some change, maybe there will be some mistake on slides. Better to share from Drive so that the updates will uh, be fetched. Check if it works. Then we'll go on <coughs> the presentation. This is uh, the source file and it has extension Scala. Uh, uh, the thing that we were working with called worksheet and we were just doing this for simplicity because it's, it, for me it uh, looks very similar like uh, Python notebook. Uh, Jupyter notebook, and you don't need to do. Uh, well, it, like this, this is a source file which are commonly used for Scala programs, and worksheet is just for proof of concept of 
doing type in some some yeah. So as you might know, this first statement here is packaged. Uh, so this is the uh, mandatory. Well, no, you can omit it. Uh, but the thing is that uh, you have to define some package usually. And package is basically the uh, the path in the project tree. There is a project root. There is a uh, folder with the sources. And in, in this folder, some example will, will correspond to folder com, and then under that folder example. So this is the way uh, uh, source files are structured in the GBM world, basically, because this package. Uh, Will will make sense uh, when the program program will compile to the uh, to the Java byte code. So usually you define this. If you uh, make something very small, you can omit the package name and just write code. But uh, usually you structure code in the hierarchy of packages. For instance, there is, there are some files in DB access. You can put this DB and have all of the uh, files in that corresponding package. So uh, that then comes import section, but imports actually can be defined anywhere in the source file, but uh, it's a good practice to put them in the top common imports. You can uh, define Java imports. You can import from Java, uh, from GDK, from Java standard library as well. And yes. And then comes uh, this definition of hello world program, basically. and this is the way we do it. There should be an object. This is uh, mandatory in Scala. So if you want to define a, a runnable program, you should define object and then the name of the program. And there, there are uh, two kinds of syntaxes. Uh, this is more like uh, like Java syntax because in Java you define class, but you put here steady uh, public main method. So this is the sample method, the, the, the root method when where the execution starts, execution of your program starts. Even very big programs which runs on server, like for instance, Kafka itself is uh, starts from, from somewhere from the main method, basically. So this is the method which is single for the uh, for the whole program. And it takes Arguments, uh, array of arguments, which are basically the uh, command line arguments supplied from the command line. And obviously, it returns unit type, which is kind of Java void. So it means it returns nothing, uh, empty value, basically. And yeah. And another syntax is a little bit uh, less, a little bit more concise. You can use it usually. It stands AP. You, you don't need to define this uh, uh, boilerplate with main arcs and stuff like that. And but in the second case, the arcs value is uh, available as well. Yes. Yeah, so in let's say we don't need any methods. Like we just put the strings to go like the I mean. In the second object, we don't create any methods or functions. no. We don't. We don't need to create a main method. But this is uh, the uh, just the place where you can write the program inside of this curly uh, brackets. Yeah. But if you like, put the main method, so uh, it will not work. I, because ATP basically that's something that already contains. In a very tricky way, but it like contains a main method already. So we, um, I'm not sure we even can override it or something. It will not make sense. So uh, the program is written basically. But if you write in hot case like overwrite main. Uh, okay, let's try. Uh, uh, that's what I wanted to do. Switch to the code and mm, try to create something. Uh, Okay, let's create the package. One more thing about package names I uh, forgot to, to mention. Usually, the, the naming convention is to, to write the, the domain name, but in reverse order. This is the, the convention in Java world, 
So if you have kind of uh, what the main name of uh, you could yeah I mean uh, let's just add you okay so in this case this we the reverse order ua dot add you dot you could so let's define such package ua that's the only reason why why this convention works. Uh, well, for the first reason, you need to uh, somehow distinguish between packages which built in some some by somebody else. You have to define your own uh, namespace, yeah, when you write your program because you will share the code. Yeah. And the reason why it reversed because uh, it makes uh, it makes more sense because uh, this is a hierarchy and the com the usually domain name ends in some. Uh, the main name is basically reverse. Uh, that's that's the reason we used to that. But if we think a little bit, domain uh, domain names are reverse for some reason. It makes sense to write things uh, from the left to right here <laughs> when we are in Ukraine, uh, in the Western world. Um, okay. Okay. So we define the package. Let's uh, let's pick, pick here a new Scala class. And write main or wherever. Let's let it be main. Oh, you know what? Let's um, let's not name it name main main, but uh, but just copy paste what we had here. The, the example. And there the was. Class and object. Uh, we will see in a few minutes. How can I do it quickly? No, I can't. You have slides, you can do that. Uh, Yeah, I will just oh, mirror this place. I will just rename it main. Yeah, these imports are, uh, are not used basically. They are highlighted in gray for that reason. Yeah, so ID, I, I, intelligent idea is Smart ID, so it shows us this sign uh, on the runnable places. Whenever is, is there is a, a runnable program, which is defined in one of these two ways, it will uh, display you this run sign, so you can run it, run main. Okay, so now it says to me that my project does not compile, and it makes sense. Oh, sorry. Probably you get the same error because, yeah. So this is the place where you should fix it. Yeah, never do a lot of the change in the last moment. Uh, sorry, I said yeah? you need to put in the same page. You created a package, and after that, you created a need. Uh, I created a main class here. Okay, and it's Scala class. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, it's not Scala class, it's Scala source file, which is, uh, yeah, it will, it's not displayed with the extension Scala, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it has extension Scala. You can see it here in the top. Could you please explain uh, what is the main idea behind these uh, mm, extensions like Scala and CK? Uh, forget about CK. CK was just to uh, make the life easier during first class. CK is kind of Scala script 
which is uh, basically a REPL, what we did in console, a REPL, but in the, in the IntelliJ idea. This is, not, um, this is not what is used to uh, usually write Scala programs. Usually, Scala sources are used. And CK is just, uh, just for quickly uh, making proof of concept. This is not runnable file. Could we run main Scala or just uh, with our okay. Just put in it into CK file, yeah. it will not work. CK file is, uh, you can think about CK file like something which is already here, you know? Oh, I see. Yeah, so CK file kind of uh, wrapped around with this object main. And by the way, uh, the name of the source file as the name of, of the main class should be the same. We don't have a class here. Sorry? We don't have a class here now. I mean object. I'm, I'm using this Java terminology, but object is kind of a class, but a singleton class. So this is, uh, we, will, we will go through that in a, in a few minutes after this example. So this is just to understand how we are writing a program from the very beginning. And from the very beginning, we are starting from something like that in Scala. There is always a main method. I can as well create a class main and create the main method there. Yeah. Instead of open. Uh, class main? Yeah. No, it will um, it it will not work. I, I you mean create something like um, yes. Yeah, it will not work because Static. Must be single yeah, the, in Java it's called static, but there is no uh, such thing in Scala like static. For that, uh, instead, in Scala we have objects, and in objects, in Java terminology, everything which is in object is kind of static. Um, are there any questions at this point? Uh, it's a little bit confusing uh, about the object in my app. I mean, let's do it. Uh, so, <laughs> what do you mean? I, I mean, can we like, interpret this like static class? If so, then you know. You mean object itself, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I mean, in object oriented style, uh, the class always consists of methods, properties, etc. It doesn't have the, like, the code that will run itself. So it's like a constructor. Or... Uh, you mean this syntax without main method? Without any methods, we just have a code that will run. I mean, if we create in Java, I think, or C Sharp, the class where we have the code without methods, it will yeah. not work. So it's quite confusing. You're right. It's, it can be quite confusing if you come from something like Java or C Sharp, but in Scala, you can write the code exactly in the uh, class object body. And this will this will act like a constructor board. Yes. Okay. So there is no constructor. It will work this way. Or you can explicitly define it. Don't you? Uh, you can, but in this case, this is the root of the uh, Scala program, and it already extends something. So, uh, well, you can, you can, yeah, you can uh, define uh, the public constructor. My public. Well, no. Uh, this is object, which is static. So there are no constructors in the mm -hmm. object. But at last, we can do either create explicitly a constructor or just uh, write the code that will that will be. Yeah, we can. We will see in a in a, a couple of minutes when we will get to the object orientation itself. So. Um, Yeah, these arguments, you can go to the IDE and uh, there, there will be a run debug configurations where you can supply some arguments here. So we will not try it right now. We will move further. Uh, we will do it in some, uh, in some future labs. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm switching to the slides right now.
So this was about uh, the hello world, how it looks like. So now let's speak a little bit about VM overall. So, uh, so to everybody be in, on the same page, what actually happens here? So, uh, how the GVM acts basically. GVM is, you can think about it as uh, basically like a pro program. GVM is basically a program, which is very complex program, and it can run Java or uh, Scala programs basically. And the way it is done, first of all, we compile our uh, source files to class files, and class files are kind of a binary, but it's not uh, binary exactly. This is an intermediate code, uh, which will be translated, basically interpreted by the Java virtual machine to the actual machine code. So uh, remember, you have the source files, then you compile them to the uh, bytecode, uh, and that bytecode can be interpreted by the Java virtual machine, which is a program, and this program has different implementation for uh, different operating systems. But the bytecode is common for, uh, for all, the, all of the uh, operating systems. For that reason, um, the GBM languages uh, are called cross-platform because uh, the only thing that, that changes is Java virtual machine. That's why you had to install it in a separate ways on a separate environment, yeah? Um, so yeah, that's the thing. Every of the GBM languages is compiled by code, which is run uh, on, which can be run on different operating systems. Yeah, so this is how it happens on the uh, level of source files. So uh, in the Java, source files are called main.java. In Scala, source files are main.scala, but uh, any of those will produce main class while compiled. So the main class is a, uh, the, the atomic output of the compilation process on the Java virtual machine, on, on, on the Java, of the Java compiler. And this class file can be run by the Java virtual machine. But our program will consist of a lot of classes, basically, because every class will, will be represented by a single, main, uh, by a single class file. So this is how usually things are compiled in Java. So you, uh, Java C is basically one more program. This is a tool, a compiler, which can uh, compile supplied source files, Java source files. And using this uh, dash CP, uh, you can supply additional libraries. Dot jar is a uh, kind of a library in Java world. This is how we package our code into libraries or artifacts. Uh, so usually the working uh, program, which can be run on, G on the GVM, looks like a jar file. This is like exe file for, uh, on Windows, yes? But the Java produces basically a jar file and it can be run on uh, any operating system. This is how we package our class files inside. <clears throat> and besides having these um, classes inside, it contains some more meta information like uh, version information, uh, depend dependencies to other jar files, and stuff like that. And once source files are compiled to bytecode, this is how you can run the Java program and Scala code will compile to the bytecode as well. So this is how uh, we can run Java code as well. And this is uh, basically done by, the, by another program, Java. Uh, this is executable file, which uh, was installed when, when you installed the GBM, the GDK uh, on your machines. There is a executable Java, which you can supply uh, the program name and you are not specifying the class file here. Uh, so I suggest you to, uh, well, we will try something else in a minute. So this is how 
the Java programs are on. And Scala programs are compiled to bytecode, and they are basically Java programs as well, GVM, basically programs. Uh, Scala uh, is compiled the very, very, uh, very much the same way as a Java. Uh, so there is a Scala C utility, but it is installed with a, it was installed in your machine when you install Scala. So this is a program as well, which you can supply a source file and uh, optionally, if there is a dependency on other uh, libraries from your source file, uh, uh, you can supply the, the jar files uh, the same way. And Scala is run the, uh, very much the same way. You can actually run Scala, uh, compile Scala code with the Java program, but then you will require to supply uh, this library. So essentially, by the means of Java virtual machine, the Scala is just a uh, library basically and here is all of the uh, standard classes uh, which are defined in Scala standard library like all this list all these collections primitive classes everything is defined basically uh, in this jar uh, and compiled into the intercompiled uh, uh, view in the compiled uh, result basically so uh, yeah but usually, you will do Scala uh, space main. So there is a separate script. This is not a program. This is basically a script which builds uh, this one, which has to be a little bit bigger. There are some other Java, uh, Java information options. So this is how you run a uh, Scala program. And let's try to do that. Let's try to compile Scala source file into class file and then run it uh, by this command. This simple hello world uh, example, yeah? And we will do it from the command line first to understand how the things work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have to switch to the no somewhere here. So um, let's just find the um, the folder Scala where are the, the, the sources of the uh, of this project reside. So. Um, You have to compile uh, Scala from this from this place, from the root uh, of the source folder, basically. And you can do Scala C, uh, just yeah, main Scala. Yeah. So the output of this. is in the same folder where the uh, source file was defined. Yeah, and you can see there are a bunch of class files here right now. Apart from these sources, which are uh, the style extension you, read, you have right now, the class files as well. And there is some other things, as you can see. So as I, uh, as I told you, usually, uh, the program, the GBM program is not just a one class, there are multiple classes, at least for each of the uh, classes defined in the source file, but in case of Scala, there is a lot of, there can be a lot of mess like this, and you will not understand it from the first time. Uh, because of that syntactic sugar that Scala has, basically. So uh, we can run it this, uh, basically that way. Because we have this package, we have to specify that, that, that package while uh, running the program. <coughs> so this is why package matters. 
when uh, the, the code is compiled into bytecode, uh, then the program name is treated like the package name first and then, then the name of the actual uh, main file, main class, main object installer. Yeah, so we could do it uh, with the Java command. So yeah, we can, uh, what we will do, we will locate where the Scala is located and just look into it. Because this is a script, as you can see. So this is not a program, this is a script which constructs very complex Java command. This command in the end will be the, like a Java command with, with a lot of arguments. But, so this is for you just to understand what happens when you run the program. And essentially what happens, the Java virtual machine is started and you supply the, the uh, main class name as an argument and it runs this name. Uh, not even run, to be correctly, it interprets the bytecode of this main uh, file. Is that clear? Are there any questions? Sorry? More or less. More or less. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll, get to, uh, we'll get used to, to that sometime. Okay. I will just clean up this folder. This is was this was about Scala runtime and Java runtime. And let's speak a little bit about uh, how the build process, a little bit about build pipeline and build automation overall. So uh, let's let's say you have uh, a team of thirty people working on one project, and uh, Usually you will have a sub teams which will work on some dedicated uh, piece of work, piece of that project, and every team will produce uh, each own piece of work in the in some uh, in some way like some artifact, some artifact, some uh, packaged, basically binary. And you have to manage these dependencies somehow because one team can depend on some other team uh, on the result of that team. And when they are working, they are producing uh, updated versions. Of, uh, there is artifacts and you have to manage somehow these dependencies. And more than that, as you uh, have already seen, all these class files, uh, you have to package them somehow into jar file. There should be utilities which can do that. And we can do, which can track a uh, version of code and dependencies between uh, these components. And whenever you import something from the external library, that external library will have the version. And those versions can be incremented, stuff like that. So when you have a big code base, this has to be somehow managed and uh, the build, the, the artifacts that this uh, uh, code base should produce should be uh, somehow managed basically. So this is how the usual process looks like. So first of all, you uh, develop code, you basically write uh, source code, then you compile it, then you run your unit tests uh, to assure that this works. And only after that, you package the artifact which can contain a version, something. Uh, and then some, some process like publish happens when you publish uh, your, your uh, result of work, your artifact, some 
binary repositories. There is something called binary repository where, it, where all artifacts are stored. And yeah, in, in Java world, this is how uh, the, the uh, repository of artifacts is called. Yeah. And so this is, this is something about which, which is called build automation. All this pipeline, when it is automated uh, and somehow uh, declared into some kind of language or DSL, uh, there are different kinds of build automation tools. There are some of, some, some of the examples here. For instance, Ant and Gradle are Java-based. So what, they, what these tools do is basically automate this pipeline. So uh, they know how to compile code, they know how to run the tests, know how to find the tests in which folder they are, uh, they know how to output the, uh, the, to produce a, a test output, they know how to package all these different artifacts from different dependencies, and they know how to publish it into this central repository. So this is called uh, good automation, and there are simple tools like uh, those examples. And in turn, there, there is another kind of thing which is called build automation server. For instance, Jenkins can be partially called build automation server. But in the case of Jenkins, this is a little bit more complex software. This is more about uh, continuous integration and deployment automation. But uh, what it can do, it can automate your build uh, as well. So for that reason, in Scala exists its own tool, which is called simple, simple build tool, but it's not simple at all. I can tell you, uh, historically it was called simple build tool. And what it does, it defines project structure, uh, how the, uh, where your code resides in a project, source folders and stuff like that, because you usually have separate uh, folder for source files and for test files. It manages project dependencies. Whenever you have external dependency uh, on some other library, like for instance, Kafka is a separate library. Uh, it defines versions of new environment, like Java and Scala version. Um, it is defined using its own DSL, but basically this is Scala code. And yes, you define the version itself, version of your code itself, and this can do basically all of this, all of the tasks that I showed you on the previous slide. This can compile, test, package, and publish, uh, and publish your build. And this is the example of uh, like very basic SBK file. Uh, you have to keep in mind this is this is basically a Scala code, but this is uh, kind of a DSL, and Yes, it looks like uh, their own language, but a common structure is you define a name. This is mandatory in this BT file. This is the name of your application. There is a version of your application, and there is a Scala C options. There can be Java C options as well. Then, the count, then uh, comes the section of library dependencies, which are external dependencies and artifacts which are downloaded. Uh, and Keep in mind, some of the artifacts can be uh, have to be supplied for from the test stage to compile test files to run them. Some of the artifacts are required on the compile stage of the uh, so sources uh, of main sources, and some can be uh, stated as a runtime dependence. Like at the runtime, somebody should supply this dependency for you. Yeah, in uh, Scala version in the, in the bottom. Um, so something to uh, keep in mind that, as I told you, SBT file is basically a Scala code. For that reason, uh, it has its own folder with a uh, build uh, with a build of, the, of those source files, and this is kind of a common project structure of SBT. Uh, project. First of all, you have a built SBT file which defines this uh, uh, 
uh, build, which have this build definition basically. Then there is a project a folder in which uh, some additional SBT files are reside and where the SBT itself is built into the target folder. And then there is a SRC main Scala, SRC main, uh, SRC test Scala. This is, this is called like a Maven, Maven common uh, package structure because of the uh, tool named Maven, Maven in, in Java, uh, which has defined this common structure, which is used everywhere in the Java uh, project. And it starts from the SRC folder, and then there are main and test to separately track test files uh, with unit tests, a source files for unit tests, and uh, main source files. And you can mix, basically, mix together the Scala and Java sources in one project. Resources file is for some additional stuff that have to be included into the jar, into the package jar. And there is a couple of SBT commands. Uh, yeah, so SBT clean is basically cleaning what it already built into the target folder, because the target folder is where the, uh, art, where the build artifacts uh, reside. So it, uh, you usually use it to clean and go from scratch if something, not, uh, if something doesn't work. Uh, then there is a compile command, reload when you change the SBT file. Uh, you have to reload the configuration, so you, you use SBT reload. SBT test to run unit tests, SBT run to run a main class, default main class, and package to package the everything into a jar. And the way it is packaged, basically, you can define uh, step by step into the uh, SBT file. Basically, in SBT file, you can write the Scala code. Scala, uh, you can write in Scala the build definition itself. So you can do anything you want uh, during the build. Basically, call it uh, call the REST API, or call your MAM, but I don't know, like wherever you want. So uh, let's try it, basically. Let's switch to the mm, the console again, but let's go to the uh, root project folder, which has to be yeah somewhere here. No. This is a root project folder. Uh, can you see this? I will make it bigger. Yes, so to see what is uh, what files are here, you can see there is a build SBT project SRC target. This is a common structure of SBT project. And uh, what I can do here, I can clean up the target folder and then run the SBT compile, for instance. And The SBT tool itself uh, can be used the same way as Scala tool. You can uh, just write SBT here and enter the environment, the SBT environment kind of the SBT command line. And when I enter here, there is something like help, I guess. No, no, something like that, yeah. Can write help and see a list of commands. Well, it doesn't look pretty on my screen. And if you list common uh, common commands that you can run in this SBT environment, these are called SBT tasks. And all of this clean package compiled, the, they are tasks basically which can be defined or redefined in your uh, build definition file. So here I can uh, run uh, compile command. And what I can do here, I can run for instance this main file. And for that, uh, there is a separate SBT task. I should stop using word commands. It's basically tasks, SBT tasks. SBT task run main, 
and UA and UA2, okay. This is how I can run the uh, program from SVT. And this is a little bit easier than doing this from, uh, from just the Scala tool. Yeah. Mm. Okay, it supports stop completion and then there is a help as you have seen. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so SBT2 will we will use uh, SBT2 and SBT project definitions for uh, all of the upcoming labs and for the final project as well. This is a standard uh, build tool used uh, used for Scala. Okay, let's. How much time is left, basically? Oh, sorry. <laughs> what? Till the next lecture, because it does the uh, end of this lecture. As, as, I think in 10 minutes. We started at 20. In our schedule, we have monolith block from uh, 2 o'clock to 6. Oh. Ah, okay. so it's your decision, memorial decision. Ah, it's yeah. our decision with Volodymyr. Yeah, but my life should uh, stop at 4. Yeah. At 16 o'clock, yeah. So we have like 10 minutes left. Okay. So let's let's start looking into object oriented and how it can be used in Scala. Uh, just something to remember from the uh, yesterday class. Uh, everything is an object in Scala. So um, in this regard, Scala is even more pure object-oriented languages in Java itself, because in Java there are primitives, but in Scala everything is an object. <clears throat> and yes, you can, uh, every operation is basically a method call. Every function you call, this is a method call in the object-oriented meaning. And even more than that, uh, even function itself in Scala is an object. We will see what trait means, but this is something like class, this is actually an inter something like interface. So there is a function definition in the Scala standard standard library, uh, and there is a definitions for every function up to twenty two arguments. Remember that uh, <laughs> number. So uh, all of these uh, syntaxes with functions. This is basically a syntax shooter, and internally it transformed to the. Uh, to this object, to the instances of this function way. This is one argument function, and there is a, also this function zero, which is a binary function. Yeah, to, to better understand this code, we have to uh, go through the next slides. So these are common elements of uh, object-oriented programming in Scala. There are classes, there are traits, and traits are something like interfaces in Java, or, uh, or other object-oriented uh, languages. And there are these objects, which we touched a little bit. These are like uh, singleton uh, instances. And when, once you define this object, this is like a single instance for the whole program, for the whole GVM. And there are case classes, which are special cases of classes, basically. Uh, so comparing to Java, I don't know how much people here write in Java, maybe not that much, but uh, usually Scala classes are compared to Java, and in Java you have to write that much boilerplate to define such a simple thing like a class with two fields. And in Scala you just need to write this. Uh, so this, this is a common class definition. And with the two arguments, 
the person with name and age. And yeah, and you instantiate the class the same way uh, as in Java with the keyword. And remember about that object. Everything uh, in these curly braces is a default uh, constructor of the class. You can write anything there. And this will be treated as a cons default constructor. And this default constructor will take two arguments, which are uh, supplied in this syntax in the uh, beginning of the uh, everything in the parentheses up to the person class name. So you can define any logic there, but you can as well have the uh, members like fields and, and methods usually that you can do in uh, any object-oriented language. But uh, one thing worth mentioning is this syntax with bars and vowels. So if there is a bar, this will correspond more or less to the Java class, like a mutable, uh, the class with mutable fields with getters and setters. Do you know what the getter and setter thing is? Yeah, I think you, you have uh, classes in object-oriented programming. No, no? Ah, okay. So this, is, this will correspond to the usual uh, class in Java or common object-oriented language. But if you write well there, then there will be no setter, basically. And when I'm saying getter setter, in Scala, this will, this will look like the same uh, the method with the same name as this field. So on the instance of this class, you can uh, just write dot name and this is, will, this is, will be like a getter of the field name. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, mm -hmm. and if you omit either val or, or var, this is going to be like just a constructor parameter. parameter and you will not be able to uh, retrieve this later. This is like, this will be like a private parameter with no uh, getter or setter if you omit uh, at the vowel of R. Yes, and traits in turn, uh, they are like interfaces, but with uh, one difference, they are like interfaces. You can define methods uh, there, but uh, difference to Java is that you can also define the code, the implementation of those methods as well. And you can define values as well. So traits are basically, uh, in Scala, they are the same like classes, but you can define anything, anything you want there, but they don't have constructor, constructor and they are, they are a little bit more flexible with uh, this extent uh, with, with the inheritance, basically. Yeah, so this is the way, uh, sorry? So, like, can you, like, create there for inheritance, yeah? So, can you create, create instance of uh, those traits, or they are only to create... Yes, you can. Yeah. You can, but this will be, like, implicitly, you will create an anonymous class. Oh. Yeah, something like that. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. You can write, for instance, new int q. We will see in a minute uh, if you, if the time, no, time is, uh, ends, time ends and we have to finish this. So yeah, uh, let's finish with traits. So yeah, you can extend traits the same way as an interface in the common object-oriented fashion, but you also can, um, you can mix in traits even at the time of instantiation, the concrete class, for instance, I have this in queue implementation, but I can uh, add some more methods, even at the time of instantiation and provide the, uh, provide the, the implementation. So in this case, for instance, there will be anonymous class created. And that for, for that reason, we, we have seen so, so much class files when we compiled single source files of Scala, because all of this stuff will be created like a separate class files. Uh, so that's what you can do. And yeah, objects are basically a single tongue. 
And once you create, uh, once you define an object, there is only one instance of it in the whole GVM, in the whole program uh, that is run uh, on the GVM. And yeah, you can write the, um, the same way, any, you can write the, any fields or methods as in class, but you don't need to write a new keyword when instantiating it. Yes. What about the trait? So the trait is actually more like a class with some restrictions than like an interface that you can even create if you in, in, uh, call a new with the uh, name of some trait. Yeah. This is like interface, but more flexible. And you have you can have implementations in trade in traits. Uh, this is different to Java, but well, in Java eight you can do that as well, as I remember. So traits are more flexible uh, than interfaces or uh, than usual interfaces. But uh, if comparing traits to classes in Scala itself. Traits are more flexible because there can be multiple uh, inheritance. You can mix ver uh, how, uh, that many traits as you want. This is different to, uh, to, to Java, for instance, because in Java you have only single inheritance of classes. You can inherit from multiple interfaces, uh, but interfaces cannot contain implementations. But in, in Scala, Traits can have implementations and they can be mixed in. Uh, you can use extension methods on the traces. So yeah, in Java, I mean. I don't know about Java, it's sharp. It's it sharp, it's extension it's methods, so the actual interface will have the metaphysics with the implementation using this extension methods. So there like is, in Java, there is something similar. Well, in Java, Probably no, but in Scala uh, there is a separate pattern uh, which is called implicit class, and we will see what it means on the next classes. Uh, yeah, there, there is something like probably the extension methods in C sharp, uh, at least as I understand what it what it is in C sharp. So uh, yeah, so this is a quick summary on objects. Uh, they are singleton, and they are basically a first class which is means they are values the same way as uh, primitive values or function values. Uh, so once you define an object, this is kind of a value you can pass around. And this value will correspond to the instance of that object, a single instance of it. And for instance, nil, which we used as a, the, while working with lists, nil is a object based. Okay, I think there is no more time. Yeah. Okay, thank you.